Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to get started. For uh, I think we have a lot of new clients coming through, so I'll just introduce myself quickly. But um, I'm Michael Lesky. I'm an uh, engineer here in the office. I do things, important things, things that make a difference. And I'm here to talk because Joe needed somebody to talk and didn't ask me what I wanted to talk about, which is why there's a bunch of question marks up on the screen right now, because you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about like what what do I want to talk about? And so, you know, some of you might have heard this morning stand up that, you know, I love the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is like one of the most fascinating things to me. They this this is the extent of their area that they covered. And one of the things they did to do all that is they they let people be who they were. You know the you, know, you think you think Ottoman Empire. You think um, you know uh, the religion is, is sorry. Yes, there's a lot of bad things, but in the height of it, um, there was they they covered a lot of area and they did this through like uh, not converting lots of people. But there's. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I don't know. I felt that not a whole lot of people would be interested. So then I thought about like one of my favorite math proofs, and one of my favorite math proofs is from Futurama, where there's an episode where um, Dr. Ken Keeler, he's he was lead writer for it, um, had to solve this math problem in order to make the episode make sense, where uh, everybody was switching brains, but they couldn't switch back with the person directly. And so this is the proof for. Um, any number of switcheroos if you switch with people and switch back. But then I realized that I think there's like two people in the office that would want to do a math paper club with me, which if you want to do that, you should talk to me later. So then I, then I decided, all right, what, what do I want to actually talk about? And so I'm going to trick you into a core practice talk around security. And what, what does security mean when we're building applications? So just as a reminder for core practice talks, that this idea is that we want to transfer knowledge to, to new pivots or new people, uh, revisit assumptions we have, uh, communicate better, and make sure that we're able to do things like say, this is why we think this is important. Like, why, why is security important? Is it just important because my CIO says I can't deploy this software until it passes these checkboxes? Or is, it, is there something more fundamental uh, to that. So um, I spread out mics here because I want you all to participate. Otherwise, I'm just going to come up to you and ask you questions. Um, so does anyone, anyone know why they do security? Consumer protection. All right, you only do, you only do security because of the consumer protection, apparently. But um, um, but there's, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to. Um, I went to a, a talk last year from Caroline Wallen. She leads, um, she's led several companies in, in their security transformations, whatnot. And you know, some examples were brought in is that you have to follow SOX compliance because you are doing financial things, or you need to follow these other regulations because someone has defined them. Usually, usually it's a government organization. Um, so. Uh, one thing you can do when trying to figure out what why you're doing security is is, is start small. Like, um, you know, maybe maybe you don't have to wait till you were broken into to to realize that. Hmm. I guess I guess uh, I guess base sixty four is not encryption as you know my my passwords or whatnot. Um, and there's there's these steps that you can you might want to consider taking to how you get there. So like maybe you start by just hiring someone where their job is say, hey, I want you to think about security for our small application, our startup, our, you know, what, whatever that may be. Um, and lastly, I think it's, it's like if you can start small, then maybe you can build that mindset. Like how many of you think about security when you're pointing a story in IPM? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to keep showing up to a lot of IPMs and pointing out things. But, you know, that, that's a mindset that maybe, um, maybe we should have. Or, or maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm wrong. I look forward to hearing you tell me why. Because um, I like learning. So, 
maybe maybe since no one said they were thinking about it, um, does anyone want to share a reason why they maybe don't think about security? Maybe because it's uh, set globally. Yeah. Sorry, there's also a mic by you if you want to use it. Sure, said globally. Uh, I thought I saw Pete's hand raise. I think it's hard. It's hard. Security is tedious. Tedious? It's unsexy. Unsexy? I would thoroughly disagree with that, but that's a different problem. Um, yeah, no, these these are all these are all reasons. So um, this, these these are tough things to, to think about, but um, yeah, I'll be honest, I don't know what to do because I was expecting slightly more positive things, but I am, I am not expecting this, so this is going to be fun. Um, so <clears throat> these might be reasons you want to do security um, instead, of, of, in, instead of just talking about like why, why is it hard, and user trust is I think the one that I always think of is that um, when I use different applications, when I have to use Google or um, Facebook or I don't know, whatever, the young people are using to chat on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, um, I want to know that my data is protected. I'm giving these companies lots of information, which they're going to sell in some cases, but in other cases, I want to know that I'm, I'm protected from something and when that happens it's a huge trust loss um in in the in what you think about that company like uh, i was talking with someone the other day about sony when um, they went through all their hacks and even though that was the picture side there was a lot of trust that had to be regained on their playstation game side because they were just associated with the same company um other ones are compliance with the law i mentioned Socks is a compliance uh, framework for um, companies to follow. Um, maybe you have um, uh, different international laws. Uh, um, what's the European one that was passed? Uh, GDPR um, was passed, uh, General Data Privacy Regulations. And so you, you, you now don't have a choice. You have to follow the law or you can't operate in that country. Um, there's a whole bunch of U.S. newspapers that have blocked IPs from Europe because they have decided they don't want to bother implementing GDPR and will and not allow you to opt out of things. Um, and then a last one I heard from a lot uh, from a lot of conferences is this: there's just a bunch of CEOs who are just like, I don't want to be that company. I don't want to be that company that lost everybody's data. Um, you know, and there's a lot of them out there. What's what's uh, another fun? Equifax. That was a fun one. Uh, I hope you all got new SSN numbers. So there's all sorts of companies that do something with security. This is just what I pulled from AppSec this year of sponsors. Um, in case you forgot, SecureWorks is Dell. But um, <clears throat> there's like, is this, is this, does anybody use a security tool in, in their job? And everyone at CoreLogic should be raising their hand right now. Darshan, what do you use? Darko. There you go. Um, you know, uh, uh, people in Pivotal and in, in Cloud Foundry, we, we have some different security testers that come through and test things. I don't think we have one general one that's run in pipelines. But yeah, this, I don't know. This, these are like heavy handed. These are hard. You have to like decide what's the difference between all of them. Should I just go with the cheapest? This one said it finds all bugs, but that one said it found all bugs. And then someone tell, someone like me tells you, none of these find all bugs. Um, in them. And so I want to point out that there's actually some open source tools that are um, easy to, well, easy-ish to use. Some of them are getting better. Zap was notoriously bad. So Zap is a, is a, can be used for pen testing, but it also built into your pipeline. It's made by OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project. And they allow you to just kind of send your web uh, traffic through it so that if you're trying to go through your web app, you could try to scan and see what various inputs you could be doing. Like, are you vulnerable to SQL injection? Because that's fairly easy to test out. Um, 
Do you have flags that aren't set? Are you using HTTP only cookies uh, for your session instead of um, allowing your JavaScript to modify it? Because um, then you're vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Um, and I think something that I've been mulling about, and I kind of want to hear if anyone else has tried this, is I might actually consider setting up separate pipelines for security where, um, so I, you know, everyone here I think does some form of test-driven development. So they have a pipeline, you have some code, you have some tests, you run them, you have confidence that your code behaves as it should, and then you say, uh, here you go, PM, product owner, end user, here is an artifact that I am not totally embarrassed by that I think is going to work for you. And another idea might be is like, um, how do I show confidence that my product is secure in some manner? Uh, so I know on, when I was doing a stint on Cloud Foundry, I played around with a, a tool called GoSec, which just did static analysis. It looked at your source code to find things, um, which was interesting because I learned that Go apparently kind of expects you to hand roll your own SQL queries, which I still find terrifying. Um, and so it would point out things to use. Uh, but maybe there's a downside. Maybe it's flagging your pipeline all the time for things that are not actually problems. And so how, how much time should I spend triaging false positives uh, or, or something like that without accidentally setting it up so that I get um, a, a positive pipeline when there's actually should have been a failure in there? And I don't know. I think you have to come to a team conclusion or maybe you find out who that security person is. Like, I'm curious, can anyone name the security, like lead security person at, the, at their place of work that they would go talk to if there was an issue? That's not Darshan. <laughs> Michael Oleski. It's better than nothing to say my name, so. But like, that's, that's something that's, you know, comes to mind. Like, I think a few teams have, had like an issue come through to them. So I know when I've done some client projects, I had something come through Veracode. I've had um, other ones come in through uh, uh, an email or request through the PM because they were reached out to by either a customer that was using it and they ran a security tool or something like that. And um, yeah, I think what I really want to advocate for is is a closer relationship with your security team and maybe maybe it's just chatting with them once a week there's there's so many things that the security professionals know but have found various success in the agile world um they security has only recently learned how to work in waterfall um, strategies and the reason they were able to do that is waterfall development time as most people know is really really long you you have your product requirement and then you spend like months a year 18 months trying to build everything out to release it in one giant go and that was great for the security people because they had this big architecture diagram they could start doing f mappings and flows of where are vulnerabilities where could a bad actor come in and you know, time to analyze it before you got to the the end and then realize that there was a crunch period and other sadness. But um, what do they do in Agile land? So, I mean, I would love to advocate that each team once a week spent a time drawing, here is my architecture and here are some security things that I'm vaguely aware about. Or or even just putting yourself and saying, I'm a bad person and I'm going to try to cause havoc on this application. I'm going to try to spam requests. I'm going to try to uh, send fake information. I'm going to, and, and just, just work through that flow. And I'm not saying spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'm saying like half an hour, once a week, maybe that works, um, which falls in the line of, I think it should be simple for development teams. You're not going to have, there's a lot of, all, all developers, I think, want to write code that is good and help somebody. And if I can't make, if you can't make this process simple, then no one's going to do it. There's all these like heavy handed ways. There's like, oh, well, I'll just tell all the developers to run this scanner before they push their code. And I would ignore that. 
a hundred percent of the time because it broke my flow. But if it's something integrated into my IDE, if there's uh, you know there's IntelliJ plugins for Veracode that I've not used because they were cumbersome to set up, but there's other flow. There's other things like um, one I saw was Zap has a heads up display now um, because I guess they wanted to go for the whole fighter pilot thing and. It's, it's interesting to me because it's just a plug into my browser. So as a developer working on a web app, I do on occasion actually have my web app running and will go to a browser to see it do something. And at that point in time, I can have Zap just point out the things in my flow. I haven't broken my flow because I was already going to open the web app. Um, there's some styles where maybe you're doing everything through automated end-to-end -end tests and you never actually open your web app and maybe that maybe that doesn't work for you and then we have to figure out what would. Um, so I think those are my, my big things. I don't actually have war stories, but what I'd really like to have before this, go straight to thanks, okay, fine, whatever. What I'd really like to have is I would like to try to facilitate um, a discussion around security, so. Um, I do encourage anyone who has uh, thoughts, questions, ramblings um, to, to, I think I kind of spread out the mics, but, um, you, you know, what do people, what do you all think of, of security? Or I'll just keep talking and tell you things. Nope. <laughs> it was fun while it lasted, though. Okay, so like, I, if I feel like I work in a really big project and security just feels overwhelming, like, where do I even like? If, how do I even begin to assess like, security and the things I have like, such a broad scope? But there's so many possible ways and avenues. How do I like? Is there a way you like to pick one and kind of go for it, or do you have an approach or something? Yeah, sure. And if anyone else has thoughts, please feel free to participate. But the, uh, the question or discussion point is around like, I feel my project is so big or so many pieces, where, where do I start? Or how do I start? And I think the simplest thing to do to start on any, on any project is to understand the pieces you're working on. So I think if I ask most people here, um, for whatever project they're on, they would at least be able to give me a vague boxes and line type diagram where like a, a user interacts with my software through this entry point and that could be I visit this web page, I go to I type in this CLI command, I send this web re I send this curl request. Um, and then you can work through what that flow is because you already have to know that flow because otherwise you don't you how are you going to build your application and um and so once you have that flow, there's some actually there's uh, there's a couple of different um, tools out there that can help you. But once you see that flow, you'll start to notice things. Like you'll see, okay, my entry point is this, let's say website. So this this web point. So that is the untrusted boundary. That is where I am taking untrusted user input, and I'm going to do something with it. And so now you figure out where your trusted line is. Right, so you so everything on this side, every everything on one side is the web browser and a mixture of evildoers and people who just want to get their stuff done. And on the other side of the line is your code, where you start to have more um, control over what's happening. And so that's that would be where I would start as soon as you start flowing that. So there was um, I was actually playing around with a, a tool called Threat Dragon. I think it's. Oh, watch, but it's a it's a tool for building uh, security models, and it's a JSON format, so it was easy to like keep as part of my repo. But it was another. It's it's interesting because it's also a tool that helps you just diagram your own architecture in terms of services. So um, I think that's where I try to start, and then you can go from there, and that's when you go um, do other things. Um, I think if you want something simpler than that is um, something I learned from um, a product manager at a security conference was they were in charge of security. It was actually Riot. So Riot is notorious for incredibly independent teams um, to the point that they can't actually enforce a security mandate across all the teams. Um, 
because the teams would just say, this slows me down, I'm not going to do it. And so they've instituted a couple different things to try to encourage them. So they do like bug bounties, and then um, they noticed that some teams were getting like tons of bug bounties against their products, and other teams were getting hardly any. And they were looking at that, and basically the data said that the teams that were having less bug bounties um, tried to spend two minutes before they pointed a story talking about what could a bad actor do in that story. And that was enlightening to them. They, they did this for a year and found that um, everybody basically leveled up their security. And it wasn't a whole lot. It was just like a little bit. Like, you know, no one, no one went from, you know, bottom of the pack to top of the pack. They went from like, you know, bottom to pack to a layer, a, you know, one layer up or something. And I think that's incredibly valuable. It's just saying like, you know, oh, you have this, um, you have this feature that allows me to send messages to um, like a host. Like in their case, they were trying to organize um, uh, some sort of competition where there was a host organizer and the participants could message the host. And there was a, someone pointed out that there was nothing stopping the host from being spammed by a bunch of people, just like either in terms, and it's not necessarily that the, the content was mo malicious in the code sense, but it, the content could totally be malicious in the like um, insulting a person type sense in, in terms of derogatory statements and other things and whatnot. So what they ended up doing was before they um, pointed that feature, they added um, a, a, a requirement around it, like an acceptance criteria that there's a, a, a big red button that says stop all uh, chats and just kill chat for everybody to do that. And so I think that kind of thing is even simpler than trying to diagram out your thing. Um, I probably mentioned that one first because I like that one. But, but like just two minutes on a story before you point it, thinking about what an evildoer could do could really help. Does Cloud Foundry have exploratory testing? I know Tracker does. Does anyone from CS? No. So I know exploratory testing in Pivotal is still done some things. In fact, the Tracker team in Denver has, um, I think, two or three dedicated exploratory testers, and they're not they're not so much focused on security, but it happens to pop up that way sometimes, but they're they're focused on like doing unintended things, like you know, okay, this endpoint takes in a JSON list. What happens if that list has three million things on it um, into the system? Um, type things, which could cause a crash or other things. Maybe it doesn't leak data, and I think there's room for that. Um, if anyone wants to, uh, uh, Chris mentioned Elizabeth Hendrickson. She has, we have her several copies of her book in the bookshelf back there. I, they're pretty short. I totally recommend reading them, if only to get an idea of maybe how your new spikes should be written in terms of exploratory mindset, mind, mindset and how you want to try to accomplish something or understand how a system works. Because there's also the idea that I'm given this code that I've only been giving a verbal description of how it does end user type things, but there's no other documentation or tests. And so how would I, how would you explore a code base to learn more about it? Yeah. So the, the questions around like how is data often leaked from the from companies that have leaked data, and it's mostly SQL injection. Oh. Okay. It's really it's really mostly SQL injection. It's SQL injection is a fascinating bug in the sense that every almost everyone knows how to prevent it, but it's still the most prevalent thing. Like those those things come in there. There's occasionally things like phishing where someone sends out information about passwords. I think that's kind of what happened to Sony in some cases. Um, 
I think Equifax was, Equifax was an unpatched bug in the server, which I don't think was, that was more like buffer overflow things. But a lot of them are just like, you know, um, quote unquote script kitties like type, type things. Because again, SQL injection is a really easy one to brute force on those websites. <laughs> Is there or should be done some planned actions from a bunch of people or one guy? Or it can be done like steadily starting from commits of a particular developer when you just think about your commit and you do security. Can it be followed out uh, or it's necessary to do a whole project of securitization? So the question again for videos is should I should is it necessary to have a whole project or whole person leading a security effort versus like can I trust my individual developers to think about security and I don't think the first one's actually an option because there's a there's there are so many more developers than security professionals to go around there's like um, uh, if I asked how many of you had a dedicated security professional on your team, I'm pretty sure you would all tell me no, but I kind of have a vague idea of who maybe to try to contact if I wanted to ask questions. And, and the reason I say this is I think um, there's enough in the, there's, there's small pieces enough that can be done to make lives easier for developers to think about this, whether it's a, it's a tool like one of the ones I mentioned being in the browser, or it's working on a sh pipeline to understand things. And it's, it's um, I think it's gonna be a waste of time in a sense, because you, in, in, in the waterfall method, you have this, all this time to kind of get out because you're saying, I'm not gonna do it till everybody has rubber stamped this. And in Agile, you're, in most of the projects I've been in are trying to cut a release once a week-ish, you know, depending on, on your sprint and your flow and everything. And, and I think you should involve that security person. I think you should invite them to come along. I think you sh should try to ask questions about what could happen, even if you don't know if there is a thing, like, to do it. But, so basically, yeah. there should be some sort of, for example, if there is only the one year of the project, of the project so sort of a review still should be done from the security perspective uh, before developers start doing secure commits. I mean, sort of a review or what we have now. Maybe, maybe, like maybe, maybe, maybe you don't need a whole review. Like if you like, I don't want to advocate for code review type things because um, I think there's value in them, but maybe not from the security perspective because it's. Like most things in, in programming, it's going to be easier to put it in there at the beginning than it is to try to shoehorn it in later. And um, that said, I think like you should you should chat with people who have an interest in this. Even if you have an interest in it and you just like read a couple of like random articles, if you're interested, I can point you to OWASP literature or other things that are made by a community of people who want this to be easier. There's, there, are, there are so many talks at um, AppSec California, the security conference um, down the block, is uh, about how do I put security in pipelines for agile developers? There's like so much, like the security people are almost terrified of agile development because they don't know what to do with it. And I think most of them would be thrilled to talk to somebody who has some sort of interest um, in learning at least basics about like, things and some of it's going to be built into your language or your framework or what you're using so even just learning like if you're on java and you're using spring as your framework it's probably valuable to at least understand how spring co security configs configures things for you or if you're in rails rails i forget what the um the there's like a specific library i'm thinking of for user login type things but there's there's a couple things in there and just like learning the tool learning what your framework or language provides you will help a lot <laughs> yeah, cool um, well I think I've used up the half hour but thank you all for listening to my rambling and my journey through many slides and enjoy the rest of lunch <laughs> <laughs>